Now we're gonna to start to incorporate the palm method, which is a way to utilize your palm to measure your food. Now this is a great tool to kind of introduce serving sizes to you without being overwhelmed with the food scale. But as well, your hands go everywhere with you, right? So if you're out traveling or maybe you're at a restaurant, it's still a great way for you guys to get serving sizes in without having to travel around with the food scale. Now for the most part, our hand kind of matches the, the size of our body. So it's a great way to measure your protein, carbs, and fats to ensure you're getting enough food for your body size. Now your palm, excluding your fingers, is going to be your protein serving. So what we're looking for is just the palm and a roughly about the same thickness. Now for your carbs, your serving size is going to be a cupped hand. For your veggie, we're looking for a fist size serving. And for your fat, it's going to be roughly the size of your thumb. A common question that always comes up with fat is how do you measure liquids, like your oils? You can use your tablespoons to use those to measure for your fats. Now we're gonna show you guys how to measure out a meal utilizing your palm. We're gonna use the female fat loss as an example for how to measure out those foods. So we're gonna use ground turkey as our protein serving. And again, what we're looking for is the protein to be roughly the size of your palm, same thickness, excluding the fingers. So you can pick the meat up if you'd like, or what you can do is simply place it on a plate And then what you can do is just simply lay your hand over it. So this one, if you look closely, you can see that some of the meat is a little bit outside of my hand. So what I can do is just remove a little bit of the ground turkey. And then lay my hand back over it. And that's roughly going to be one palm size serving of protein. All right, so for our carbs, we're going to be looking for a cupped hand. So again, you can place it on the plate. We've got our sweet potatoes. And then what you could do is place your cupped hand over that. So that's going to be our one serving for our carbs. All right, so for our one serving of fat, we're going to be looking for roughly the size of our thumb. So we've got our avocado. We're going to place that onto the plate. And again, it's going to be roughly the size of my thumb. I could take off a little bit off of the top. And that would be more accurate with the serving size. All right, now, so for our veggies, we're looking for about a fist size serving of your veggies. We're not super concerned with you guys going over a little bit on your veggies. So we've got our squash and a little bit of kale. So you can do one to two fist size servings of veggies. So you can do is place them on the plate, put your fist over that, and that's gonna be roughly two fist size servings of vegetables. All right, here we are back again. Uh, Coach's Roundtable, episode 10, Salvi, is it? 10, episode 10. Well, I think 10 is a good number to talk about what we're going to talk about today. And it's the five steps to getting your shit together. We were going to call it something else. O originally, the idea that was thrown out there was, I think it's time for us to talk about personal accountability. And I realized very quickly, no one's going to watch that because... <laughs> It's like the one thing that people don't want to hear, like uh, up to this point and, you know, in the almost five years of street parking, it's like, here's what to do and how to do it. And here's the little tips and steps and try this instead of that and more than nothing and all of this. But um, at the end of the day, none of those things are going to work if your first response to a lot of it is, but I have this problem or but that doesn't work for me or but this, this and this. Right. So. Personal accountability, we're going to talk about how to get out of your own way, how to get out of your own head a little bit and figure out what things you can control and um, what things you can't and focus on the things that you can mostly. Um, and I'm pretty excited about this one. I think it's a really important one. It's kind of like that, like you don't want to hear it. And for, I think for those of us on this panel, the coaches, uh, we're pretty solid when it comes to fitness and nutrition. And so it's easy for us to sit up here and be like, oh yeah, like these are just excuses. Let me make it very clear. If we were to talk about personal accountability in other areas of our life, we would be cringing just as hard as you guys might be when we're directing it toward fitness and nutrition. So personal accountability or getting your shit together is not just a fitness or health or nutrition related thing, 
Um, you could apply these same steps that we're going to talk about to your finances or to your organizational skills or to parenting or whatever. Um, so they're just general steps to taking the blame and putting most of it on yourself and figuring out now what do I do with it um, and how do I improve my life um, because I'm in control of much more than I maybe want to believe that I am. So uh, let's get right into the the five steps, shall we? And we'll, we'll, we'll share some tidbits of uh, how this has applied to each of us in our own lives and um, where we're at with it right now and things that we've seen maybe from a coaching standpoint also. The first one, and I'm going to let, uh, Jeb is super into this stuff, by the way. And I mean, we all are, but I mean, he's probably the most into it, I would say. That's why, I mean, he has a whole podcast about this kind of stuff. I'm <laughs> with the Jeb and flow. So the first one uh, is awareness slash honesty. So step one, awareness slash honesty. What are we looking at with this one here, Jeb? So, um, well, first of all, I have to acknowledge that this was Alex's idea to do this topic. Um, so I think both of us uh, are probably really into this. And when we were talking earlier, we have some different kind of points of view on personal accountability, what that actually means, and you know, maybe even on a larger scope, how does that relate to actually getting your shit together, you know? We definitely both agree. I think we can all agree that it starts, number one, you have to get honest with yourself. You have to be able to take an honest look at whatever the challenge is, whatever the situation is in your life, and be able to see, like, well, what part of this do I have responsibility for? What part of this are maybe just excuses that I'm allowing to have more power over me in my situation than I should? What are the stories that I've been telling myself over and over and over again? And um, it's interesting, I was reading in a book last night, kind of how sometimes we have these, these stories or these reasons or excuses that, that get in the way. And um, we identify with them so much that we actually spend a lot of effort protecting those things rather than letting them go. But where it starts is being able to just take a step back and honestly look at yourself and your situation, whatever it happens to be, and just start to try to identify what are the things that are going on here and maybe even what's behind those. Like, these might be some of the symptoms. Like, oh, I don't have time. Oh, my kids are, you know, bothering me so I can't work out or my spouse doesn't support me or something. Well, <clears throat> okay, so that might be a symptom of, of a problem, but maybe you can go a little deeper and, and find out, like, maybe there's a root behind that. So that's kind of where I would start. I think one of the places too where people need to start maybe even before they get to that step um is and this is something that you know we had talked about a little bit when we were discussing doing this topic is what is it that's bothering you that you want to change and what is it that you actually want so and and what's your belief system behind that too right like um uh, oh i want to lose weight but i can't because my kids or whatever okay so I want to lose weight. Why do you want to lose weight? Let's figure out, do you actually like, is that something that you really want? Or is that just something that is pop? Like, it seems like everybody wants to look a certain way or be like, what is your motivation behind this before you start to even like go down that path? So I think nowadays, because we have access to so much information and we see so many different just life options, it's like, well, I want the career and I want the stay at home mom. And the, this is just like me making my list. Right. And I want the, I want to spend a lot of time doing fitness, and, but what do you really want? Like, what are your values first? And then make sure that you're not saying that you want something or you want to make change that you don't actually want. You're just kind of going with what's, what seems normal or what you think you should want to do or change and then start diving into, okay, what do I have control over? And what, what things am I like, making excuses or beliefs am I holding on to, like Jeb was talking about. What do you think, Alex? Um, 
I was just thinking, I don't, I don't know that it's something that you can conjure up awareness. I think it is something that you kind of just find it in your life and you're really uncomfortable about it. You know, like, um, it don't, you almost get to a point where you're just like fed up with your, your, your bullshit, honestly. And, and it's that pain or that discomfort that motivates you to start, okay, maybe I need to look at my life and see what's up, you know, and then I can start to get honest and develop that awareness. But I mean, you know, I'm a type one on the Enneagram. So part of part of my like ism would be wanting people to do things the way I would want them to, to have them done. Um, and I just lost my train of thought. Um, what was I saying before? <laughs> you were talking about how like uh your enneagram type makes you want people to do things the way that you want them done and you think it's not that self-awareness is not something that you can conjure right up so much yeah so there are things in other people that i feel like could be better that i would want to improve like hey you could do this my way and I could nag or I could, you know, I could like convince or, you know, do my best to try to control them or change them. But unless they want that for themselves, unless it's something that makes them uncomfortable, it's not going to be motivation enough. So I guess it's just I think it's important to know that it will come with time. I think you just I think why it's so great that Jeb and Carolina are doing a mindfulness focus group right now is because when you actually stop and slow down enough and you get rid of the distractions, those things start to rise to the surface and you realize, oh my gosh, like there are things that I'm not happy with in my life and now I can do something about them. I think that's so true. It's one of the things that we say all the time as coaches where it's like, I can't want this for you more than you want it for yourself. Like, I can't want you to eat the veggies more than you actually care about eating. Like, I can give you the tips. And that's, I think, where, where, where step one starts. Like, what is it that you actually want? And what is it that then? So, Jeb, would you agree with step one to make it, like, very clear? Like, where do I start? Because this is all very, this is all very, like, still out in the, in the ether here, right? Yeah, like, okay, what, what's the actual step? What is it that you actually want? Del el eliminate things that you are doing just because it's the popular thing to do it's because it's what's normal for a society or your family or your neighborhood or whatever what's actually important to you and then what are the things that are holding you back from that literally like write out a list and just everything that comes to mind that makes this thing difficult for you and then you can start to pick apart with honesty what is coming from a belief that I have like my kids take up too much time. Well, is that true? Or is that just something that you're latched onto because it makes it uh, easier to believe that it's gonna improve? How is your life gonna improve if you had that thing? There's a, sorry, there's something that I came across recently. It's called the seven layers deep why that I really appreciate. But basically you start with a very superficial why, like I wanna lose weight. And then you add another layer why do you want to lose weight? And so you keep doing that until you get to se the seventh one. And once you get there, it's like, it's pretty spot on. And it's probably not what you thought it was in, in the beginning. I actually did one of the um, more than nothing podcasts about this too. like figure out what your why is. I mean, most people, they don't, they don't go past one layer. They're like, oh, I want to lose weight. Why? Because I want to look better in my clothes. Why? so that my husband will love me. And it's like, okay, there it is, yeah, you exactly. know? And it's like, is that actually gonna happen? Is that actually gonna change? And like, you gotta, that's a relationship problem, not a weight issue at that point. So these are the things that people don't wanna do, but that's mm -hmm. part of that honesty. Um, so start there and figure out what's actually going on and why you're chasing the things you're chasing and what, it, what things that uh, you feel are holding you back that you might be in more control over than you would like to believe. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, the a lot of awareness comes from traumatic events, which is unfortunate. And I've realized that, right? You hear the stories all the time where, oh, this person had a heart attack 
or this person had this happen, they passed out or whatever, um, to get them to finally have awareness like, oh man, I am, I need to do something for my health. Then, because I think a lot of the times fitness is attached to as aesthetically looking a certain way mm. and not to the, your overall well-being as a healthy individual, right? I think, um, you know, people fall into the trap because of marketing. We spoke about this in previous coaches roundtables where fitness, it's easy to attach fitness to something that looks good, right? But for the most part, for the majority of the, the people out there, um, we're just trying to do it and we're trying to get you guys to understand that we want you to do it for the health aspects. Um, and that's because it's so important, right? For the longevity of your life. And I think it's, a, um, we don't want people, if we can prevent even a couple of individuals from getting to the point of having a, tra having a traumatic event that will get them to, okay, to finally wake up and have awareness, then that's great. Right? So it's, um, but very few times you get somebody who's actually making change for the better without having such a traumatic event happen because a lot of times we're very stuck in our ways right it's you know not a lot of people are going to push you if you you know there's not much res resistance coming right because not people won't know what are those things that are holding you back unless you open up and be vocal about it so i would encourage you to find if you know that you're suffering inside and you know that you got to do it for the better because you're starting to feel things and you're like oh man but you can't open up about it Find a way to make it entertaining. Find a way to make it a game, and which will lead into the next things that we're going to talk about in today's Coach's Roundtable. Um, but, you know, you got to make progress because we're not just preaching this message to get you to look better. That's not what this is all about. We're, getting, we're trying to preach this message to get you to feel better. And there's no denying what fitness does for you on an emotional, psychological, I just all the benefits of it, you know, so... Jeb, would this step be where people would, we've all done this exercise before, where you draw the circle and you put the things that are in your control in the circle and everything that's out of your control on the outside of the circle. Is that part of step one or is that going to be more in part of step two where you would do something like that? After you've made your list of reasons that's, that are holding you back, do you then take them and, and do that little diagram or is that part of step two? So I would say it's a great segue from step one okay. into step two because you could definitely start that in step one and then in step two you would probably go through the process of, of refining it okay some of those things might come out of the circle and some new things might come in so once you've made your list of like okay i want to work out i've got I've, I've i've figured out why and i it is important to me and i do want to make it more a priority i'm not just going along with what i think i should be doing because it's what i see you know in front of my face every day like it's actually something that means something to me here's all the reasons that it's not happening right now you can start to then look at those reasons and be like i can't afford a gym okay that might be out of your control at this period of time so it's like okay great i'm going to put that and i'm not going to try to change that it's not it's not where I'm at. Maybe you could look at your finances or whatever. Maybe that isn't more in your control than you think. But you start to put time, like time management is something that's in your control. Um, can I afford a pair of dumbbells? Yes, I can. So that's something I can control. So start to figure out which of your excuses are things that you can do nothing about and which of your excuses are something that you can control at least in a small way. And step two then after you've started to kind of play around with that is acceptance and humility. So Jeb, talk us through what step two is and where we go once we figured out what it is that we want and what's we believe is currently holding us back. So, um, I mean, acceptance, right? <laughs> That's the big key word here is you have to recognize the things that you can't change, that, that this is the reality of my situation today, not tomorrow or in the past, but right now, this is, this is what's happening. And I need to accept that. Alex and I were talking earlier about, it's almost like the stages of grief. Like you have to go through this, like you, you deny it and then you get angry and you don't want to let it go. And then you finally, you come to terms with um, what might be an excuse, what might be something that you actually do have some power and control over, 
what are some of the things that um, that you need to figure out a way to to work with? Because right now they are there, and they're going to stay there for the time being. Can you give me an example? Because a lot of times I I I fear what people accept are their beliefs that aren't necessarily true. So like I'm I don't want anybody watching this to be like I have b- bad genetics acceptance moving on like that's just my life like it's out of my control or for me like oh I'm getting older so I just need to accept it and and not try so hard anymore because I'm just too old for this or whatever so I worry about people accepting things almost as a form as, of an excuse as opposed to accepting reality but also pushing to improve if that makes sense yeah it does and i think if you've done a good job in step one of being honest about this stuff then it's pretty clear like well am i just using this as a crutch or am i accepting the fact that yeah you know like cardiovascular disease runs in my family i have to accept that but i'm not going to let that control you know my life in one way or another, I'm just, that's now something that I know and I can use that information to hopefully make the right choice and do things for my heart. Um, So I think that um, what, now this might be taking things a little bit bigger, but right now let's say you're not happy with your body composition. Well, are you gonna be happy when your body composition changes? And who are you when it changes and who are you now? You're the same person. So right now you're just fine and you need to accept that. Don't wait to be happy. Don't wait to accept yourself until a number says something or you have X number of followers or whatever it happens to be, you know, it's right now. So I think acceptance is like, it's, it's that. It's coming to terms with the reality of the situation and accepting it and then moving towards those things that you honestly want to pursue. Well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go deep on this one. So I'm gonna open up, nice. you know, a can of worms with honesty. I think one of the biggest ones I think we discuss often internally um, is the body positivity movement because it's just such a, a very sensitive topic that nobody really wants to cover um, because I think that's one of those um, movements that requires a lot of honesty and acceptance uh, and you need to truly um, I, I get really frustrated it's a big pet peeve when you get all these social media influencers out there preaching I am healthy when you exterior you look at, you look at them you're like I don't think you are actually um and i don't think you should be pushing this message you know because a lot of the times when you get an individual um there are exceptions of course but a lot of times you'll take individuals that are very vulnerable to this route of you know going the health and fitness route and so when they see somebody that is an influencer that they can relate to is now preaching this message you're pushing down a wrong path because a lot of the times what i will tell you guys which is one of the hardest things to do is change, right? Especially for yourself. So can you look at yourself in the mirror, honestly, and be honest, be like, are you happy with where you're currently at now, right? It's frustrating to see when you get these celebrities as well, as well right? Because it's easy to, to pinpoint some of them. Or these people that were part of this body positivity movement, and then they went on this health and fitness route, and then they've lost weight in a healthy manner, and then these people get they attack them, and be like, "Oh, I thought you were all about this movement," and then all of a sudden, those followers that they had now won't latch on to them going the healthy route. Like they won't support this new journey that this person has embraced. Well, why is that? Are you mad because you also want to do that and you haven't been able to achieve that? Now, remember, none of this is going the route of you need to look a certain way, right? I think that you just, people need to get pushed in the right direction. And the only re- way you're going to do that is by having true acceptance. And the only way you're able to do that is to ask yourself and nobody else, are you happy with where you currently are at now? And if the answer is yes, okay, then fine then keep being the way you are going to be. 
But if you're no, then I would suggest that you find someone that has going to help guide you, you know, and, and that's the thing that one of the difficult things about this life it is hard to find those people that honestly want to help you. Um, you know, so it's just an ongoing journey. Right. And, but this, this movement has gone out of control, to be honest. Yeah. And I think I, like there's both sides of that, right? Like what Jeb was saying is like, listen, uh, you shouldn't wait until you're at a certain, whether it's weight on the scale or body composition or blood markers, like health markers, you shouldn't be wait. You shouldn't wait to like be happy and be just a happy human on the earth until those things are where you would like them to be. Um, and it's completely true. I think that um, I would, it's, it's something that I try to figure out how I could word it often because let's be honest, nobody wants to hear me with body positivity posts. Nobody wants to hear a few people talk hear about body positivity. <laughs> yeah, how do you, how would you they understand? They don't want to hear it from fit, from fit people because they think that we have no understanding of how they feel. And I completely understand um, that mindset. What I try to figure out how to say is it's like, if your body was not going to change at all, how could we get you to adopt these habits knowing that it's going to impact your health and your longevity and how you sleep and how you feel and how your brain functions and everything without you feeling like there needs to be a change in the way that you look to go along with it. You know, somebody commented, I was, I've been doing a series of posts about um, one of the other coaches roundtables that we did um, the control your fitness. And I posted about alcohol today. And I, it was like a very small piece about calories and weight loss. And the biggest chunk of it was about your mental health and learning to deal with things by not using a substance to do it. And there was a comment that said like, I ditched alcohol and I didn't lose a single pound. Like, don't even get me started. And I'm just like, you missed the whole <laughs> point. Like this whole post was not about that. It wasn't supposed to be about that. Health is about so much more than the way that you look. Um, so I agree with all of that from both sides. Like you have to be able to figure out how to be happy now. And you have to not associate your health with the way that you look or a body fat percentage or anything and do this stuff for your health, not just for aesthetic reasons um, and and not to fight against it. And then kind of going back to the um, the acceptance thing where we were talking, where I was asking Jeb, like, how do you take somebody like uh, the genetics thing is a big one for me where people are like uh, and I come from uh, that where people oftentimes I, I heard it so much growing up. It's like, oh, when you get older, you just you get fat like that's just what happens that was a very common sentiment in the not just in my family but in the area that i grew up i feel like that was a very normal thing um or i just have bad genetics Let, i think there's a series of questions that's kind of like the diving into the why but like let's get to the truth actual facts why do you think you have bad genetics well everyone in my family is fat okay why why are they fat well because we have bad genetics. So hold on. Do you have anybody that's related to you that has very similar, whether it's a sibling or someone close who has lived a very healthy lifestyle for years that could prove to you that even with all those steps, they're still having problem, like major problems with their weight. Like look for somebody that might be the exception because you, if you can find somebody that might be the exception, it's probably true that the reason that most of your family struggles with weight is because most of your family has a similar lifestyle. We tend to have a similar lifestyle with the people that we spend the most time with in the household with the people that we grew up with. Um, you know, so look for those exceptions, like what's actually true and start to dive a, a little bit deeper into that and accept that maybe your genetics aren't as bad as you think they are just that nobody's tried to break through those barriers with enough consistency to prove whether that's actually the case or not. Yeah. Because ask yourself this, if you truly stuck the course with eating whole unprocessed foods, you ate, you drank your water, you had, you know, you had your proper meals, you know, proper protein, healthy fats, you know, um, good carbohydrates, you slept well, you just moved, right? Are you going to fight what your body is naturally going to, your body naturally is going to change whether you like it or not. If you follow 
just those markers. You don't drink your alcohol over the top. You know, you drink your, everything that we listed, which we actually did a video um, on this, a coach's roundtable on these health, like seven steps. It's an ongoing journey, guys. That's why there is no shortcut to this. But if you actually stuck the course for longer than a two month process, do it for a year. Are you going to look at the mirror and fight your body and say, no, I don't want to look this way. No, stop, stop. You're, you're making horrible changes. Let your body run its course the way if you actually were very true with all those things, I guarantee you that you would not be fighting what your body's actually going to do for you as an individual. And there are some very real things, obviously, too, like Julian needs to accept that he's never going to be as tall as Jeb. Like, that's fact. We know that's not going to happen. There's nothing that he can do, so that's the out of his control. There are definitely, and not everybody's body is going to look the same or even be, uh, you know, if somebody has a, a higher risk of cardiovascular disease in their family, they're always going to be maybe not as high risk as they were when they improve their you know, their lifestyle, but they're going to be more at high risk than maybe somebody who doesn't have that in their family at all. Um, and I always say that like doing all of this, the stuff that we try to teach in the street parking community, it's not going to make you look like me or like Jeb or like Julian or like Alex, where you're not going to have the exact same health markers as us. It's going to make you look like you healthy. It's going to make you the best version of you that you can be. And the only way to find out what that is, is to just follow through with it. So the steps we've decided what we want we've made the list of like reasons we've started to figure out what which of these things are actually just excuses that i do have control over what do i not have control over i'm accepting the reality that i'm 5 10 and not 6 3 i'm 5 9 i've <laughs> really got to acceptance okay. i'm 5 See? 9 6 2 also i'll be okay. honest <laughs> um i've accepted that i am a busy person and that i'm never and that i don't have two hours to spend in a gym or that i live in the middle of nowhere and don't have access to as many resources i've accepted the things that are currently or maybe forever out of my control um i've accepted maybe where i'm starting from too i'm assuming that that's a big part of it is like where are you at and how long is this actually going to take is that part of acceptance too yeah, actually, <clears throat> what's been going on in my head, because next to acceptance, we have the word humility. Um, and that's a word that I have fumbled around with a lot over the years, because for a long time, I confused it with humiliation. Um, yeah, like that I would need to be brought down a few notches in order to like find acceptance like with something. Uh, but what I've come to understand it as is just an accurate representation of where I am now, like absolute reality, no fantasy, no rationalization, no exaggeration, no minimization. Like it's just it's just the truth. And I think we have to be we do have to have some humility. We have to be humbled to that because I think we spend so much time not being aware, distracting ourselves, looking at anything but that that we maybe or you know maybe in my case f have a more grandiose vision of ourselves so maybe it does require knocking us down a few notches also in my case sometimes it means i have a, an inferior vision of myself that i have to kind of bump myself up so again it's more about reality than it is about humiliating or putting down um so I definitely, I mean, absolutely, reality, like getting to that point is is a huge part of acceptance. It's essential. What are some, like Jeb, what's something that you, like let's give some examples, because I think it, it helps uh, these ideas that can be a little bit more vague. What's something, and we'll keep it health and fitness related for right now. Um, what's something that you've had to accept in your current health and fitness journey, or maybe in the past you you accepted that was, that kind of goes along with this? Um, so, okay, so here's something. I um, probably now, you know, in the last couple of years have been the most muscular than I've ever been. Nice. Growing up, I was always very, very skinny. And no matter what, when I look in the mirror, I see a very skinny person, right? And like, 
you know, I know we'll get into it, but like a little body very mean there? things were said to me Jeez. throughout my life because I was so skinny. And, um, you know, I've had to accept that, like, like I and I wanted to be big, like guys want to be big. And I did everything I could to be big. And I ate myself into just like horrible pain and discomfort for long periods of times because I wanted to get up to over 200 pounds. And I got to over 200 pounds. And it I was I was miserable, but I was pretty jacked. <laughs> but it was very uncomfortable. And so um one of the things I've had to accept is that like, and this might piss people off, but just like I am a kind of a, a, a lanky person. And so that is going to affect my um, you know, certain athletic abilities and performance. And it just it is what it is. Um and it's okay and I can still be strong for me, you know, and that's cool. And I think the cool thing is, is like, you proved that you could do it. So you didn't, you didn't be like, oh, well, that's just not possible for me. I think that everyone, it, it's possible for you to do way more than you, than you think. So I love that Jeb didn't accept that it, and just say, nope, this is impossible. But then he also learned through doing it and realizing like, this actually doesn't make me as happy as I thought it was going to make me. I'm freaking miserable and I just need to healthy for me is not this. Mm -hmm. And so there are many people out there that think like, Oh, I could never be that lean. Well, you probably could. I'm most people can be super duper lean, but once you get there, you might figure out that it's not exactly what, what you thought it was going to be or make you as happy. And that's where, again, we want to go back to, let's find out what healthy looks like for you and your lifestyle and what actually makes you happy and what you want in your life. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example. I like that one. I have one. Okay. Pretty recent. Oh. Um, I mean, it's no secret that Julian is a big fitness bully, but um, back in October, it was actually, I think it was Jeb's birthday workout maybe. Anyway, that was I remember this. Yeah. And, you know, like Julian Fitness bullied me into using 105 for the hang cleans and there was like 81 of them. It was a workout very similar to your birthday workout. And I freaking hurt my elbow and everybody knows it. Um, and anyway, I, I thought about this last night when I was thinking about the topic because I was like, I was very proud of myself because I could have easily blamed Julian. I mean, I always talk about you fitness bullying me, but I could have, like, I could have been pissed off, like low key, like super mad about it. But I immediately looked at the situation and said, okay, what part did I play in this? Am I a grown adult? And did I agree to using 105 pounds? Well, yes, yes you did. I did. Like, I think when we can take those situations, whether they're like traumatic, I mean, that's not, an elbow injury is not super traumatic, but when those come about, we have an opportunity to say, what part do I play in this? And any anything that involves you in your life, you have a part to play in, in it. And so many people don't want to look at that or admit that or accept it. Um, and from that moment, deciding like, yeah, this is my, this, this is, I have a part to play in it and I have a responsibility now to rehabilitate my elbow while still prioritizing my fitness. So for months, I mean, I did a lot of stuff without using my right arm and it was- She avoided Julian at all costs. I did, I didn't work out at the garage for a long time. <laughs> um, that was another part of the acceptance though. I was like, hey, if I'm not, <laughs> if I'm not okay enough with saying no Julian, not today, then, I I need to remove myself from that situation. Like, and that's just something that I had to accept. Of course, I love working out at the garage. It's fun. But at the same time, I have to set certain boundaries because I've come to accept that that's just, I'm not in a place yet to say no to Julian. So until I get there, I'm going to stay away from Julian so that I can protect all of my limbs. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's something as simple as that. And then, again, like that's kind of a, but I then had to accept, Hey, I'm injured, but this is still important to me. And so I'm, I'm not going to tolerate this as an excuse. And I, I wanted to mention that too, 
that I've had to dis- I've had to really get clear about what I mean about acceptance and that I don't mean tolerance because acceptance to me is like a launch pad. It's like this is a starting off point and the world is my oyster and I have a lot of opportunities once I accept this. But if I tolerate something, that's like a roadblock. I can't move forward after that. Um, so, yeah. I have one more thing to say about acceptance before we move on because I, I, I think it's this is, this is probably the hardest step for most people. Um, part of the acceptance process, and it was just like popped up when Alex was talking about um, her situation, was in a lot of the in a lot of cases you're gonna have to accept that you can't have it both ways like i want to you know and we i use lose weight just because it's such a common goal right um i want to lose weight this is why you know i've done all the work i've made all the lists and this at some point you're gonna have to accept i have to change some things i can't keep doing what i'm doing and being who i'm being some things are going to have to change. Maybe not as drastically as, you know, a lot of what you read on social media would have you believe in hours and hours and eliminating entire food groups and things like that. But I have to accept that I'm not that person or I don't have what I want because of the way I'm currently living and I'm going to have to give something up and I need to accept that. Um, I think people try to have their cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And they bypass the acceptance of if I want to live this way, if I want to have this lifestyle, if I want to, you know, have these, this certain level of health, that some of the things that I currently enjoy are going to have to be minimized or eliminated from my life. And accepting that before you get into the next step, I think is going to be really important. So the next step is taking consistent action. Um, I've accepted where I'm at. I've accepted that I'm going to have to give some things up. I know what I want. Here are the things that I control. Can control. How do you? What kind of actions do you start to take, or what? What would you say this next step? How would you describe it? Consistent action, or the more than nothing approach. So we put more than nothing on there because I think that really does kind of symbolize what we mean by consistent action, right? It's it's the kaizen approach. It's continuous improvement. It's like just a little bit at a time. As long as you're doing more than nothing, the ball is continuing to move in the right direction. Of course, over time, what that more than nothing looks like is going to grow and expand. But when the action stops, you know, the momentum stops and and you start to kind of go back down that ladder rather than continuing to move forward. And I think one thing that's even more important, like obviously, if you consistently eat your vegetables and consistently work out, then yes, you are going to see physical changes in your body and you are going to see uh, your health markers improve. But what you're also doing is showing up for yourself every day. And when we talk about personal accountability or getting your shit together, what we're really talking about is improving the relationship that you have with yourself. Um, And like, so there was this Harvard study, right? It was 75 years long that they followed people starting in the Great Depression. And like, there was like 700 something people that at the beginning of it, and they're still going. There's only like 60 people left, but they've added a bunch more. And they just ask people questions and study their health markers and take blood and and all this stuff. And they've been doing this for 75 years. And what they found is that the people that are happy and have quality relationships are the ones that live the longest. They're the ones that are in the best health. It's not the people that worked out the most. It's not the people that were the strongest, the fastest, uh, the leanest or, or whatever. It was the people that had quality relationships and you cannot have quality relationships with anybody else unless you have a good relationship with yourself. And if you are riddled, as most of us are, with all kinds of strange stories and maybe past traumas and and whatever, then you have to kind of work through that by getting honest and by, you know, accepting what you can and can't change, accepting where you want to go and what you might need to sacrifice to get there, and then taking consistent action. And in the process of that consistent action, what you're doing is you're showing up and you're proving to yourself over and over and over again that you can do this. And that's where that relationship 
to yourself starts to improve and things really take off. Yeah, I mean, it's like boils down to where you're at currently in your life, positively, negatively, both. I mean, we all have positive and negative in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's just based on a, the series of choices that you've made up until this point in your life. And every time you make a different choice than you were making before, it's moving you in the right direction. It's just each individual small choice. And I think what we've said so many times on Coaches Roundtable and in so many different areas in street parking is what we see consistently is that people try to completely overhaul their lives all in one step. It's not sustainable. They don't even intend to sustain it. And that's not at all what this step is. It's not like, okay, you figured out what you want. Now, how do you completely empty your entire refrigerator and pantry and fill it with stuff that you've never eaten before? And, and you know, this whole plan, it's like, what's just the next choice that you can make that's better than what you would have chosen before. Maybe like instead of, you know, Julian's talked about, instead of pulling into Chick-fil-A like you normally do on the way home, pull into the grocery store and pick up something to cook at home or maybe even something that's already been prepared instead. Just one choice at a time toward, and well, I, I almost went straight into the next step, right? Um, but I think that's what we're talking about here um, is just small choices and okay, how can I be better? How can, maybe, maybe I'll put one sugar packet in my coffee today as, as opposed to two, or maybe I'll, um, Go for a walk. I'm not. I'm not ready to do a workout, but I. I'll go for a walk instead. That's a better choice than sitting on the couch, and watching TV, which is what I would normally do. Just start making small choices, and it really compounds so much more than people think. They think they need that huge overhaul when they really don't. Um, and work within the confines of the things that you've accepted. Work within what your current schedule is. Work within the fact that you have three young children. Work within the fact of what your you know, if you have an injury that you're working through or whatever, but don't let any of those things stop you, as I think kind of mm -hmm. what we believe with this step. I think um, something that's really important with being able to even perform that action the first time before we get consistent with it is knowing what that action is. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information out there about like nutrition and exercise. So what I think is even more important, aside from finding a resource that you can trust, um, that is, you know, no nonsense and authentic, um, which I think we provide, right? Like we provide tools, resources. We provide new ways to think about things because if you've developed awareness and acceptance, one thing that you probably have come to accept is that your way of thinking has not done you that well, if it's something that you're trying to fix, obviously. Like, there's something that I hear a lot, it's your best thinking got you here. So if you want something different, you're gonna have to find some new thoughts. And it's probably not gonna come from your same head. So we need other thoughts to come into our lives. And I think, I mean, I would say like these coaches roundtables are a great resource. Street parking, you know, in and of itself is a great resource. But even beyond that is joining a community where you see day in and day out people posting their stories, posting how they overcome, how it's a mom with three kids and they're overcoming this obstacle that you also have. And so you get this spark of hope like, hey, they share a, a similar experience to me and they're doing it, so that means maybe I can do it. Um, so I think, again, it's just important that you get plugged in with a community and maybe some, some people who can guide you on whatever area of your life you feel like you're struggling with, that you've accepted and has humbled you. Find, um, authorities in that area and let them guide you through it and then find other people who have gone through that too. And um, I think that will be a great guide to taking action and then to being consistent with it. And I would be, I would say to um, allow it to be a journey, right? Like don't wait until you feel like you have all of the answers and all of the knowledge to take any sort of action. I think of my own like journey through uh, just 
even like nutrition, for example, from where I grew up in in a family that I, we didn't eat particularly badly, um, but there was not a lot of like fruits and veggies and it was like cereal and, you know, pasta a lot of times, things like that. Um, it was a journey to get to where I am now. And I'm glad that I didn't wait until I know everything I know now because I never would have learned it, right? So there was like, okay, maybe um, sugary soda is bad. So it went to the diet soda. And then it went to the, okay, like maybe less of the diet soda and I should probably not eat so much candy. And then it was like, okay, so uh, I know Rice Krispies are bad for me. So let me buy Kashi cereal instead and Kashi cookies and like these things that are like maybe made with a little bit better ingredients. And it was a journey through it to get to here, which should be expected. So don't wait until you have the perfect info or you're ready to make um go from where you're at maybe you're eating panda express and mcdonald's yeah getting pre-prepared foods from the grocery store and whole foods even if it's got a little bit more sugar in it still but it's better ingredients that might be a step and then there's another step and then there's another step and that's okay and it's going to take some time but don't wait until you're ready to go fully or until you feel like you know everything because you will never know everything we don't know everything i'm still like trying to read so many books and learn so many things when it comes to fitness and nutrition. And I've been obsessed with it for like 20 years. So, um, just start moving in the right direction, make a better choice. It might not be the most perfect choice, but make a better choice. And then that moves us perfectly into the next thing, which is expect yourself to make mistakes, expect to have off days, expect to miss a workout here and there, expect to cave and eat, you know, a cupcake at your, at a birthday party when you were planning on staying strong and not doing it. Um, expect imperfection is the next one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, there, there is no such thing as perfection. Um, and I actually did an episode of Jeb and Flow on this called the playground of imperfection, because you kind of have where you are now, and then you might have some idea of like, what perfect adherence to uh, whatever I think is going to get me towards where I want to go. So if it's like the template life or if it's a, a workout routine, right? Perfect adherence to that is somewhere out here. And here's where I am now. That space between where you are and perfection is your playground. Go in there and run around and dig around in the mud. And like, you're going to mess up. You're going to fall off expect that to happen and enjoy the process like you're saying um and just really quick like one word that you said when we were coming up with this list that was was not on what we're kind of looking at is complacency um and i think that the difference between like acceptance and being able to move from that to consistent action is is compl is, is not getting complacent right and i think that when you fall off the horse or the bike or whatever analogy you want to use, which inevitably will happen during your process of consistent action, you can't let that allow you to get complacent. Um, so it, it's something that there, there's no one out there that is perfect. And as much as social media and every other screen or device or source of information tries to force it down your throat, perfection does not exist so enjoy this journey and get back on the horse when you slip up a little bit because we all do it mm -hmm. and i think sometimes those imperfections it's not even necessarily a misstep uh that you've made it's life it's alex's elbow injury she could have been like crushing it and she was like following this plan and she was super you know leaning out and all of this stuff because she had these goals and then the elbow thing happens um, which I guess was partially your choice to listen to Julian, but it could be, you know, you roll your ankle walking on the sidewalk. It could be something that just happens where it wasn't like, oh, I messed up and I made a bad choice and now I'm falling off. Life will happen to you. And so um, you need to be able to mold and move around it and continue on your path. And maybe, you know, you're you're taking a little curve and going the long the long way because of something that came up or, you know, a choice that you made that kind of threw you off course, but you're still moving forward. Um, 
and not letting it take you completely out of it. And we see that so often. I see it on the Facebook group all the time. I was doing so good and, and I was like following the template and then X and then my husband lost his job and, and now I need to go work or, and then my kid got sick or then I got pregnant and I wasn't planning on it. And so now it's just like, I don't even know what to do. I'm just going to give up completely. Um, life happens and your health and fitness are supposed to be a part of your life, not something that's only there when the circumstances are perfect. Um, and we see it all the time too, or like I was doing so good and then I went on vacation and I felt, you know, and I enjoyed my vacation and now I'm just, I can't, I can't get back on it. That should, you should go on vacation. You should be able to enjoy yourself. And maybe you're not somebody who has any desire to work out or eat good at all on vacation. That's fine. Like plan on that being part of it. It should be part of it. It should fit in and you should expect that and know that it's part of it from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So where do we go from here? Those are, that's only four steps, right? Um, we've got it all now. Now, what do I do? W where do I, what's, what's step number five then? Did you want to say something, Julian? I feel like you, you yeah, can't creep the last step is just repeat one through four, just to kind of wrap this job, this, uh, this chat up pretty soon. Cause I know we have a couple questions probably as well. And just all the other stuff we have post this, I know we let some time pass on these awesome conversations. Cause I mean, we, we can go, we go deep on all these subjects guys, honestly, just because there there's, there are common repetitive things that pop up in our community and people around us. Um, so, um, but we try to summarize it in this, but yeah, and step five would be just repeating one through four to keep it, to keep it simple. Yeah. Because I'm assuming that part of, um, you know, Jeb and Alex worked on putting the steps together. You can't just, you've got to reevaluate, right? You've got to constantly, how often would you say that someone needs to reevaluate what their goals are and what means, I mean, cause I'm a, you want to talk about Enneagram types. I'll do it every day. Yeah. I'll dive deep into like what do I want and who am I and what's going on? Um, you you got to be careful of doing that too often, right? Or you're just, you're just all over the place, but you have to then reevaluate. Okay. I'm doing this. I've been consistent. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not letting myself make excuses, but accepting where I am and like all of it's happening. When do you go back and say like, is this still what I want? Or is there something else that I want? Or is there a little bit of a different iteration of what I've been doing that would even be serve me better? It's a really good question, and I don't think that there's a really um, easy answer for that. But the reason why we put this step, repeat steps one through four, which might sound a little obvious or, or not, um, is because it's, it's a never-ending process. So I think that the time to, to, to reevaluate your goals is like, once you have put everything you can into achieving that goal and hopefully you've achieved it or gotten somewhat close to it and realized what the view is like from there and then you can go back and and reset um but kind of like how you were mentioning that you know you've been in the fitness industry for like 20 years and you're still a student of the fitness science right so there's never, we're ne we've never, we're never at a place where it's like, okay, we're done. I know everything and I'm just, I don't have to work out anymore. And like, <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. So just being a constant, like a perpetual student of, of yourself and, and learning more about yourself. And that's kind of this whole thing is, is this process of, of learning about yourself and, and it's like James clear, right? It's, it's not, it's who you become in the process of working towards that goal and how you do that is through the habits. Um, so I think it's really important to, as you get to the next plateau, there's going to be some new thing. And then that's when you repeat. And if you don't make it to your goal or whatever it is, then, and you've honestly, you do an honest appraisal. Have I given this every ounce of my effort? then you start over and you kind of reassess everything. Yeah, I think I think something that often makes me sad is when people attach themselves so much to um, an outcome without reassessing 
along the way if it's still what they want and they just stick to it without thinking about it that that makes me sad at times i think the best example that i can think of um i have examples in my own life but i think the best example that i can think of when it comes to like a, a really big fitness goal is is julian actually um as a crossfit games competitor um had big goals of like competing and then he he did that in 2015 and then and making it again but then something life came in and it's like uh, Miranda's gonna have a baby and is this still what I want and if he wouldn't have like taken the time and I think many many people would not have taken the time that he took to be like is this still what I want is now that this child is going to be in my life is this still who I want to be is this still the most important thing I think a lot of people would have just kept going on that path and we I've seen it and uh, maybe those people have thought about it and it is the most important thing but I think you see you know for me it could have been my career or even building street parking or whatever when when a life change happens i think is a great time to be like okay is the is the path that i'm on still the path that i want to be on um and make sure that you that you're constructing your life the way that you want it to be now not the way that you wanted it to be five years ago or five months ago or five minutes ago um and constantly kind of going through these steps and, and reassessing um and my goal for people when it comes to health and fitness would be to, honestly, I don't want it to take up as much headspace as it does for all of you. I would love for it to just become habits and it's a part of your life. I use the toothbrushing thing all the time. Like how can we help you make just working out and eating the fruits and veggies and drinking the water second nature so that you can have a healthy life and go do the things that you're passionate about. And that's what we're trying to do here is is to give you those tools so that it doesn't have to continually take up so much space in your brain. Nicole, you got any questions over there? Yeah, I sure do. So we asked uh, across a couple of the platforms, what's holding you back to see where people are struggling? So I have a few here. One is um, I go too hard early on in the week fry my nervous system right from the get-go. And basically this is the same problem I have. I feel like I peacock my entire week. By the end, you're too sore, too freaking out. What do you do to prevent that? Yeah, I mean, when me and Nicole were looking at these questions earlier, I was like, this is you. <laughs> Nicole goes full peacock on Monday and then is like dead by Thursday. So what advice would you have, Alex, for somebody who tends to overdo it? And so they're, they're actually, it's messing with their consistency because they're, going too hard like never miss a Monday type style um I mean I would say this is where a, a boundary could come into play I think uh, on a round table you mentioned like only doing the warm-up or something like that yeah I think literally putting limits on what you can get done early on in the week and I'm a I like to schedule things out and I'm very visual. So I'll actually, cause I'm, I'm, I'm some, I have a tendency to do that where I go hard early on. Like, like you're super motivated on Monday. It's easy to do. Um, so I'll intentionally spread higher priority things down like towards Thursday, Friday. Um, mostly just because I know myself and that helps me to kind of keep it pretty even killed throughout the week. Yeah, so if if the if like the vault workout for example is what you tend to peacock, do it on Friday right after we announce it or do it on Saturday when you know you're going to rest on Sunday anyway as opposed to doing it on Monday where you were planning on also working out on Tuesday and Wednesday and then you don't work out on Tuesday and Wednesday because you're wrecked from Monday. So moving things around that way. I think that's a great tip. What else? Um this one I I meant all of these basically I completely agree with. Um for me, it's with like, say, alcohol or food. Instant pleasure versus long-term success is standing in your way. How do you fix that? I mean, I think that's a super common problem. I know that um, they t uh, James Clear talks about that in Atomic Habits about like people's biggest issue is typically um, an unhealthy choice will have long-term consequences. Like you're not gonna see it right away. Where a healthy choice there's nothing that happens exciting like right after. Like when I eat the like, you know, veggies as opposed to the cupcake, like I'm not immediately lean, like right away, but I immediately feel 
the tasty treat or the glass of alcohol right away. So the rewards for things that are unhealthy choices are typically like instant. And the rewards for things that are healthy choices are typically like over here. And it's like, well, that just seems so far away. So forget it. So what, um, I think just knowing that and having that knowledge can be huge. Um, and then I know he talks about like giving yourself little rewards yeah. that are well, not That's where it's food. like expect imperfections. That goes back to that rule. It's okay. You know, you're going to have those days where, you know, don't always, you know, go 100%. No, no tasty treats, no alcohol. Like, mm -hmm. hey, if, you, if, if you're at that point, have the tasty treat, have the alcohol, and that's it. Don't, uh, don't now think that the next meal or the next treat is going to be have alcohol or a tasty treat. Mm -hmm. Like, go back to, you know, setting consistent habits and, you know, back to your normal and... Uh, I think when you think that one is going to set you down a downward spiral, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one, that's not what you want. That's when you need to kind of have a honesty, acceptance chat again. So, again, expect imperfections. What a great five steps. They just really tie into each other. Yeah, where you're not like, oh, I messed up. I might as well just, like, eat like garbage for the rest of the weekend because I had one piece of pizza on Friday afternoon. It's like, oh, well... Well, that was lunch on Friday. That's over now, and I'm back to where I, I need to be. Um, but I think, you know, just having the knowledge of that's how it works and practicing the art of delayed gratification, um, but building in times where you're not expecting perfection is is huge for that. You know, I was actually thinking about, like, our, our weekly eating schedule randomly, um, where we go, you know, breakfast, we go to La Provence, we have our nice little date there, and then we have pizza night on Wednesday night, and then on Saturday, our dinner is usually uh, Pacific House, right? It's kind of interesting because we actually, essentially, we're splitting, that's three meals. Essentially, we're splitting up a full cheap meal day, which will wreck you, in my opinion. I actually like the approach of... We have like a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner, kind of? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's kind of nice. But it's like throughout the week. But it's, So it's three meals out of the week are dedicated to having those normalcy imperfections, as people would call them, where to us, it's like, no, like, this is part of living life. Like, we're not going to hold back from going out and having a breakfast date and having our French toast or whatever, because then in turn, we continue our normal day-to-day, -day, which we're going to work out later. Then our lunch and our dinner for that day where we had the French toast breakfast are going to be a balanced meal. And then when we have pizza for dinner the, the next whatever couple days later, well, breakfast and lunch are going to have are going to be consistent meals and we're still going to have our fitness. So that's that's just part of it. You know, don't. That's why actually the approach of a full cheap meal day where you just you feel so bad, you know, Split it up. See if you like that. And if that actually helps you keep more consistency in your eating journey. Treat yourself like you're using like a like a navigation app, right? And you take it, you know what? You're following the navigation app and you're trying to get to the destination. <laughs> and you turn left when you weren't supposed to turn left. You don't just like completely go off and drive a mile in that direction. Once that's happened, you're like, oh, wh whoops. Let me just either flip a UE reel here real quick or go around the block and get back to the the route, right? Like, you don't just like, what, you know what, forget it. I wasn't supposed to turn left. I'm just going to keep going this way now. Um, and don't attack, you know, you don't also attack yourself when you do that. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. And I'm, why did I do that? And my whole life is ruined because I turned left. It's like, gosh, dang it, I turned left. Let me just flip a UE, you know? And people just latch this like negative self-talk when they eat something that they weren't, wanting to eat or they have an extra drink that they weren't planning like it just is this downward like mental and emotional spiral treat yourself like a just like a navigation system oopsie turn to left let me just flip a you real quick and get right back on course we'll take one last one and we'll close this out all right this person always puts everyone and every chore ahead of what they want to do how do they get themselves on the right track oh an enneagram too uh. <laughs> So I think that this comes down to, this touches on humility. Um, and I like the idea of humility as being right-sized, which is very close, you know, what basically Alex was saying earlier. Um, and there's ways that you can, 
you know, you, you think that you're bigger and grander than everyone else around you. And then there's times when you put yourself below people, it's fine to put people ahead of you, you know, the needs of your kids and things like that. But, um, you know, standing up for yourself is, is really important. And I think that that kind of comes into that humility acceptance, um, part of the equation. So as far as like what to do when you put all that stuff ahead of you, I mean, I would love to be able to just be like, stop doing that. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's probably a little bit more, there's more attached to that. So what I would say is to very similar to what Julian was just saying is like, just baby step it, you know, take, take one day or one part of one day where it's like, this is my time. This is where my needs are going to come ahead of everything else. And I'm just going to do this for this one little window of time, you know, and then maybe you can start to build that out a little bit in your life. And then of course, you don't want to get so far down that road that you're like, everybody else, you know, get out of the way. It's, it's my show now. Um, you want to be able to step up for people and be there for people and, and put people's needs ahead when it's appropriate to do that. But I think kind of putting your foot down and just carving out a little space to, to assert yourself and your needs is a really good first step. I think this is probably a parent. I'm assuming that asked this, not necessarily, but I think this is a big one for parents where it's like, oh, my, ki my kids need so much. Your kids need you to be mentally, emotionally, and physically healthy before anything else. Like for you to be able to take care of them, for them to have a great role model, an example, and all of that. So just remember that. I think that's something that's really easy for us to forget. Like your child, at, think, of your, think of how you think of your own parents. Your child at 40, 50 years old, when you're you know 70 or 80 or whatever, is not going to remember how clean the kitchen was. They're not going to remember how folded their laundry was. But if you can make an impact on how they see adults behaving and they see your healthy lifestyle and so they have a healthy lifestyle or they see you working hard on something that means something to you, that goes so much further than the chores that I think we let eat up um, a lot of our time. And so prioritize what you want your kids to learn from you and what, they, what they're gonna gain from you. And I don't think that your biggest priority is that they're gonna remember that their clothes were perfectly folded every single day and that you know, the dishes were never piled up in the sink. You would much rather have them gain some healthy, some healthy habits from you than, than that stuff. So just remember that. And that's something that I try to remember a lot of times too, when balancing like, even working on street parking, like Huli and I have had talks, I'm like, I think it's great for them to see that I worked on something that means so much to me, even though a lot of times I do feel guilty that I'm wor that I'm a working mom. There are, you know, so you got you definitely have to find that balance, but try to prioritize, especially if that's coming from a parent, what it is they're seeing and what it is you're letting go to the wayside so that you can take care of yourself and be the best parent that you can be. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's going to close up this week's episode of Coach's Roundtable, episode 10. Yeah. Yeah, get your, get your shit together. <laughs> um, we'll check in with you guys in a couple weeks. And remember, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with anybody that you may feel would benefit with this Coach's Roundtable. All right, guys, we'll talk to you guys soon.